أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وآله الطاهرين ورس نمبر 189 يسألونك عن الأهلة قل هي مواقيت للناس والحج وليس البر بأن تأتوا البيوت من ظهورها ولكن البر من اتقى وأتوا البيوت من أبوابها واتقوا الله لعلكم تفلحون They question you regarding the new moons say they are timekeeping signs for the people and for the sake of Hajj and it's not piety that you come into houses from their rear rather piety is personified by one who is god weary and come into houses from their doors and be wary of Allah so that you may be felicitous this is another uh, new topic brought in Surah Baqarah and it is uh, quoting a question which is put to Prophet. Uh, there are 14 or 15 cases where the Quran quotes questions from the Prophet. One of them is here. Several of them are actually in Surah Baqarah, about seven or eight of them in Surah Baqarah, the rest are in other surahs. Like for example, Yes Alunaka and Al Anfal, they ask you regarding Anfal. Yes Alunaka and Dil Qarnain, Yes Alunaka and Al Sa'a. These are the questions which are put to the Prophet. There is one hadith from Abdullah ibn Abbas who says that Ma kana qawmun aqalla su'alan min ummat Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. سألوا أن أربعة أشر حرفا فأجيبوا. There is no ummah who made as little question as the, our ummah. They only asked fourteen questions and they were answered in the Quran. However, this hadith cannot be accepted because the questions asked from the Prophet not always were answered by the verses of the Quran. The Prophet answered many questions to people. It is only uh, some of the verses that Prophet had to wait for the revelation to come, or sometimes they asked in an occasion that revelation was coming and the question was answered by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is not having 14 or 15 questions only from the Prophet. And sometimes it's not in terms of yas'alunaka, sometimes it's in terms, in terms of yastaftunaka. They ask you about your opinion uh, or about God's uh, view on something. So uh, this is a question about the crescents of the moon. Yes, Aluna Ka'anil Ahilla. They ask you uh, about, well, the translation says new moon, but new moon has a different meaning. It's, it's about the crescent. And Hilal is uh, usually in Arabic said to the to, to the crescent which appears on the first night, second night, and since some say third night also is called crescent, after that is called qamar, it's not crescent anymore. The 15th, of course, the, 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 the full moon is called badr, but the two or three nights in the beginning of the month, two or three months at the end of the month, month are called halal. Uh, they don't have names for uh, as far as I know, uh, for uh, the phases of the moon, as in, for example, in, in, in English language, they have uh, a crescent, then the, uh, the, 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 the is, they have the waxing crescent, waxing gibbous, uh, first quarter, uh, full moon, and then waning, all of these. So they have these phases in English, in. Arabic, they should have names for it, but the mainly the three names are Hilal, Qamar, and Badr. Now, it is not clear about uh, what did ask about Ahilla. Did they ask about why they happen? Or did they ask about what's the wisdom behind it? Or did they ask about what's the benefit of, this for, for it, uh, of it for us? The answer actually tells us that the question was not about the existence of these halas 
or why it happens, uh, or even what's the wisdom behind it? What's the benefit of it for religious matters, probably? And this is what we have in, in the answer that قُلْ هِيَ مَوَاقِيتُ للناس. And this مَوَاقِيت should be مَوَاقِيت for performing religious duties. Actually, in a sense, confirming or corroborating the idea that religious مَوَاقِيت, uh, the timekeeping of religious matters, should be based on halal rather than on, uh, on solar uh, calendar. Of course, moon and sun together, we have in Surah, uh, in Surah Yunus, uh, uh, I presume, we have this verse that هو الذي جعل, ال, جعل الشمس ضياء والقمر نورا وقدره منازل لتعلم عدد السنين والحساب. He made sun as a, as a, as a shining lamp and uh, moon as a light and uh, set it in different uh, uh, stations so that you know the number of years and also you know calculation of the calendar probably and it's true without sun and moon we have no calendar but without moon we have calendar we have solar calendar however solar calendar is difficult ordinary people cannot calculate solar calendar it needs uh, very complicated calculations for the moon it's very easy it's very easy everyone can see it and Probably one of the reasons that the mawaqit uh, of religious uh, timings are set by moon is because it's very easy. Everyone can understand, can see, can see the halal, can see the disappearance of the halal. And this is why we have a hadith from uh, Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq salam who says, قُلْ هِيَ مَوَاقِيتُ لِلنَّاسِ لِسَوْمِهِمْ وَفِطْرِهِمْ وَحَجِّهِمْ It's all for these religious matters. That shows apparently the question was about what's the relation between halal and our religious duties that we perform. Now, one uh, particular duty is mentioned here. Uh, among others, which is, which is Hajj. يَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْأَهِلَّ قُلْ هِيَ مَوَاقِيتُ لِلنَّاسِ وَالْحَجْ And apparently, it's a preparation for the following verses, which talks about qital and jihad and fighting. And, of course, we know in the months of Hajj, jihad and fighting is not permissible. Then, because Hajj is mentioned, uh, some, uh, something which was actually a customary practice of some of the tribes of, uh, uh, of, uh, of Quraysh at that time is mentioned, which was uh, these tribes were called Homs. And Homs means uh, z uh, from Hamas and Hamasa, meaning zealous. The more zealous people in their faith, when they wanted to go Hajj, they added something to it to show, of course, their great dedication to faith and to their faith. And that was when they came back, they said, we do not go back, go to our, into our houses from the same door that we went for Hajj, that we went for now, we have done our ihram. This is, this is of course, at the time of Shirk, at the time of Jahiliyyah, because Hajj was performed very, very meticulously by uh, by Mushrikun. So at that time, they, they thought that when we go and put on ihram and uh, perform our hajj, we come back, we do not go inside our houses from the same door. So they made a hole in the back of their house, in, 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 in the uh, furthest uh, part of their house at the back, and entered from there. And you can imagine many customs had probably developed around that. People were gathering there when the hole was made, and uh, there were builders and other things coming and doing this business, and people entered from that part. Now, here it says, وَلَيْسَ الْبِرُّ بِأَنْ تَأْتُ الْبُيُوتَ مِنْ ظُهُورَهَا It's not piety. So this was a sign of piety. This was a sign of, uh, a sign of full dedication to faith. It is not part of piety 
to uh, come into your houses from the back door. But Ber is someone who fears, of course, he is, fears God, fears committing muharramat, fears committing what God has, uh, violating what God has uh, uh, confirmed. Uh, of course, there are other meanings for this I'll mention shortly. But one of the things here is that some of us try to add things to rituals which are uh, given to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, thinking that this makes us more dedicated than other, than other people. And uh, I think this verse is not only for them who did uh, such a uh, very funny act in, in the time of Jahiliya. It's for us as well now. Sometimes we think that uh, last week, uh, the week previous one, pre the, the, the week pr prior to that, I think uh, you mentioned the, about khandaq and such things that they make. This is for very, very zealous people who want to feel that they are very zealous about Imam Hussein. They walk on the fire. Well, lay salbir. This is not piety to do this. Piety is you do not violate what Allah has ordered you to do, not what you make as a sign of piety, what you make as a sign of dedication to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the act is similar, of course. I don't want to condemn those who do it. They do it out of their, their zeal and out of their dedication. But what here uh, is emphasized is that when you add something as a sign of dedication, it is not piety. It's not regarded as piety by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Piety is someone who uh, fears to violate muharramat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَلَكِنَّ الْبِرَّ مَنِ اتَّقَى وَأْتُ الْبُيُوتَ مِنْ أَبْوَابَهَا Come to your houses from their doors وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهِ and only, of course, fear to violate what Allah has mentioned uh, for you as your rituals. Uh, there is uh, one hadith which is reported from Imam uh, Muhammad al-Baqir alayhi salam and it's mentioned in Majmu al-Bain, Ayashi, in Mahas, in other books as well. He says, Ya'ni, this lays al-bir rubba an ta'atu al-buyuta min dhuhurha, Ya'ni an ya'at al-amra min wajhihi ayy al-umurakan. It's not limited to this. It means whatever you want to do it, do it from its proper way. Don't do it from uh, the, the convoluted ways, for example. So, uh, for example, when we want to venture on scientific uh, exploration, we do it in a scientific way, not philosophically we try to solve scientific problems, or vice versa. So, anything you want to do, do it from its proper way. And uh, one of the, as our AIMA has mentioned, and many Shia commentators have mentioned as well, one of the most uh, outstanding examples of this is from who you get your religious uh, edicts, who you go to ask for your religious, uh, for your faith, for your, uh, your religious practice and belief. And this is what has come from uh, in many of narrations. Uh, what uh, Faisal Kashani says here is that Waminhu, one of the instances of this, take doing things from its proper way, taking our knowledge of faith, whether it's belief or practice, from Amir al Mu'minin, because these are the gates, the doors of knowledge of the Prophet, as the Prophet said, You should not enter the city except through the gates. Now, of course, here, Wa'atul Buyuta min Abuabuha has a very uh, close similarity to, yeah, 
come to the city from the gates of the, of the city. And it shows that taking knowledge, whether it's fiqh or whether it's belief from scholars who disagree with Imam Ali Musalam, is not permissible, or it's not taqwa. It's not permissible, or it's not taqwa for someone who has this knowledge of, of course, imamat. There are people who don't have this knowledge. Of course, they take it and they practice. But someone who has this knowledge of imama and knows the door, the, 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 the gate of the city, then it's not permissible for them to take knowledge from anyone else. And we have many narrations in this regard. Uh, from Amir al-Mu'i alayhi salam, قَدْ جَعَلَ اللَّهُ لِلْإِلْمِ أَحْلَى Allah has made for knowledge certain people which are uh, possessors of that knowledge وَفَرَضَ عَلَى الْإِبَادِ تَعَتَهُمْ and has uh, made people uh, to follow them. By this verse وَأْتُ الْبُيُوتَ مِنْ أَبْوَابَهَا Come to the houses from their doors. وَالْبُيُوتْ هِيَ بُيُوتَ الْعِلْمِ الَّذِ اسْتَوْدَعَتْهُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ وَأَبْوَابُهَا الْأَوْسِيَاءِ the, the buyut, the houses are houses of knowledge, the knowledge that Anbiya has left for their awsiyah. And also, another hadith from Imam Ali alayhi salam, he says, نَحْنُ الْبُيُوت أَلَّتِي أَمَرَ اللَّهُ أَنْ يُؤْتَى مِنْ أَبْوَابْهَا We are the houses that Allah has commanded, you have to go from its doors. And also, um, Finally, uh, another hadith from Imam al-Baqir alayhi salam who said, uh, Al Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa subuluhu wa duatu ila al-jannah wa al-qadatu ilayha. Al Muhammad are the gates of Allah. Well, we, we have in many other narrations that uh, Aimma ar Babullah. When we say Babullah, it doesn't mean that Allah has a gate and you have to go to ask them rather than Allah or make an appointment from them. It means that if you want to know God and what are your duties towards God, you go to these Abwab, ask them. So sometimes we confuse between the two. These are two completely different matters. When we say Babullah, something that you cannot directly go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you have to go through them. That's a different matter whether it's, uh, it's, it's correct or not correct. But here, especially Babullah means someone who knows about God and can teach us what is the, what are the qualities of God, what are our duties towards Allah. This is the meaning of Babullah. Verse 190 starts to uh, talk about uh, qital and jihad. And they say this is probably one of the first verses which uh, allows Muslimun to start fighting against the mushrikeen. وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إن الله لا يحب المعتدين Fight in the way of Allah, those who fight you, but do not transgress. Uh, indeed, Allah does not like transgressors. Now, as I said, this is either the first or one of the first verses, because we have another verse in Surah Hajj, which uh, probably has re been revealed uh, after this. Uh, and that is أُذْنَ لِلَّذِينَ يُقَاتَلُونَ بِأَنَّهُمْ ظُلِمُوا وَأَنَّ اللَّهَ عَلَى نَصْرِهِمْ لَقَدِيرٌ For those who want to wage jihad, permission is issued because they have been wronged. And Allah is uh, powerful in helping them. Now, the point about this verse is that some of the exegetes say that this verse is abrogated. It is mansukh. Why they say it's abrogated? Because there is a condition here which Muslims did not observe after the Prophet. Now, whether they did not observe after the Prophet because it is mansukh, or they did not observe it after the Prophet because it was not uh, 
it was not experience. And that is, قَاتَلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ Those who fight you. So it means that fighting should be defensive. If no one fights you, you do not fight. And this, of course, does not tally with what we saw after the Prophet in the conquests which happened and Islam spread by uh, moving from all directions uh, in, in the name of jihad. So uh, what, is, what is our position here? It says that only you can fight those who fight you. قَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا Do not transgress. Now, this do not transgress may actually explain. In Tafsir al-Safi, Faiz Kashani says, لا تَعْتَدُوا means بِبْتِدَاء القتال. Do not begin fighting. This is, this is transgression. If you begin fight, this is transgression. وَالْمُفَاجَعَةُ بِهِ مِنْ غَيْرِ Or, you start a battle without calling people to Islam. This is what most of the Sunni scholars as well say. It means that when you want to go and fight a, 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 a people, first call them to Islam. If they do not accept, then fight them. However, this doesn't come to a, uh, to a sensible meaning because when you go to the <coughs> battlefield or when you speak with kings, you are not calling the people. You are talking with politicians. And this is not actually calling the people at the beginning. So he says this transgression is initiating the, the, the battle. Or starting it without calling. And also doing certain things in the battlefield, which is transgression, like musla, which is uh, uh, amputating or, or, or cutting into pieces the dead bodies. And killing those that who are not allowed to kill, like women, children, old people, or those who do not take part in battle, uh, the civilians, all these are transgression from the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Fakhruddin al-Razi says that, of course, uh, there are, a lot of scholars who say that this ayah is mansukha, with the following ayah, This is very strange. We, we will discuss about that later, about the kill them whether, where, where, wherever you find them. This is after you start battle, when they fight you, of course, then you do not stop as soon as, for example, uh, one battle is finished. When the war is going on, you have to fight them and kill them, of course, wherever you find them. Otherwise, they gather force and come back again. They say this verse is mansukh with the following verse. Uh, however, he says, even if you do not say it's mansukh, it doesn't mean that you are not allowed to begin a fight, uh, begin a war, because la uh, ta'tadu only means do not transgress in battlefield. Now, Allah Tabatabai has a view on this. We'll, inshallah, uh, mention that next week when we come to the next verse, uh, which says that, وَقْتُلُوهُمْ حَيْثُ ثَقِفْتُمُوهُمْ Kill them wherever you find them. And this is one of those verses that is mentioned in the media very much. And you hear that, yes, Muslims say, wherever you find kuffar, kill them. Now, Allah Tabatabai has a very, very interesting view on this. But uh, what is the Shi'i view, before going to that, about uh, what they call it al-jihad al-ibtidai, initiating a fight, a, a war. Not even for the sake of da'wah. Is it permissible <coughs> is not per or it, it is not permissible? Now here, uh, the history, the seerah of the Khulafa has been that they initiated battles, they initiated uh, wars, to call people to Islam, we had lots of conquests. And many of those conquests, of course, we know was not for Islam, especially at the time of the Umayyads, at the time of the Abbasids. They were not for Islam. They were for, for, for land, for land, for booties, for money, for power. So we cannot approve of that. One of the reasons is that Imam Ali, 
امام حسن امام حسین علیه السلام never took part although they were always in jihad امام علی was always in jihad at the time of the prophet peace be on him امام حسن و امام حسین علیه السلام were always in jihad beside امام علی in Safin and Nahrawan and other places but they never took part in any of the uh, of the wars which were for conquering other lands or calling people to Islam and despite the fact that uh, especially the Khulafa uh, were very eager to motivate Imam Ali to go to battlefield to go and fight First of all, it was a sign of approval of the, those battles. And secondly, it was uh, a, a sort of confirmation of Jihad uh, al-Iftidai. They never. We have some narrations, uh, some historical accounts that Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein took part in the wars in Tabaristan, in, in, in the north, northern Persia. Uh, however, we can, we can understand why these accounts were forged. Only two people have mentioned this. One is Baladuri in Futuhul Boldan, who says that uh, such, such companions were in the, in the, in the fight with, in Tabaristan. And then he says, وَيُقَالُ And it is said, it was very interesting, a historian who is recording the history in, in a very clear way, it says, وَيُقَالَ And it is said that Hassan and Hussein Ali Musalam also took part in that battle. Well, this is, of course, without any value because he doesn't know himself. He said, he said that they took part. The other person who has mentioned this is Tabari. And uh, interestingly, he has mentioned the same hadith twice. In one hadith, he mentions that Hassan and Hussein took part in another hadith, he doesn't mention them. And this shows that this is an addition after Tabari. It's not Tabari who has mentioned this. Uh, the reason why they wanted to show that Hassan and Hussein took part in the battle in Tabaristan, and only in Tabaristan, nowhere else, was because later on the Umayyad and Abbasid had a hard time with Tabaristan because they had become Shia of Imam Ali al -Islam. And they wanted in a sense, to tell them, look, you are following Imam Ali, while Hassan and Hussein took part in those brutal battles, which killed many of you, and of course, uh, called in, 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 the, in, in the call to Islam, they took part. So this is also, uh, uh, this, this account also has no value, as I said, because Tabari mentions the same hadith with the same sanad twice in his book. One of them has it, one of them doesn't have it. It shows someone added it, and he actually had not noticed that Tabari has mentioned this in another place as well, forgot to add these two in that uh, hadith as well. So, if this is the case, can we deduce from this that uh, these holy people were not agreeing with these battles, with these conquests. And if this is, uh, 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 this is true, then it puts all the conquests which happened after the Prophet. And especially, as I say, especially because at the time of uh, Caliph Omar and Uthman, the companions were there. But at the time of the Umavids and uh, Abbasid, it was just for the uh, for the conquest of land. Uh, can we say that there, something went wrong and it was not permissible for them to do that, especially with, the, uh, with this verse, وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ Only those who fight you. Uh, the fatwa of Shi'i Fuqaha is very interesting here. And they say, the battle, uh, the, the initial jihad, initiating jihad without being attacked is only permissible at the time of Masu. No one else can do that. Although we have a minority of fuqaha who say that it is permissible for faqihul jami le sharayat. If there is a faqih in charge and has all the conditions of taqwa, piety, justice, knowledge, 
political acumen and all these things is permissible, but this is minority. These minority, of course, are credible people. For example, Sheikh Tusi does not allow it. He says in the time of Ma'asum it's not permissible, but his student Sheikh Mufid allows it. We have Sheikh Mufid, people like Salar, his students allowed it, but apart from that majority would not allow this, and this is what Tabar Tabrasi says here. Tabrasi here says that in Majma al Bayan, in the view of Shi'i Fuqaha, it is not allowed to initiate battle unless we have the uh, Ma'asum in charge. F among the contemporary Fuqaha, it may be interesting to know that Ayatollah Khomeini alayhi, is against it, says it's only for the time of Ma'asum, and Ayatollah Khoi says no, Faqih al al Sharat can initiate a fight. You would have thought it should be the other way around, but this is, of course, what they, uh, they, they have deduced from uh, what they have read and what they have understood from them. Did Prophet, peace be on him, start any battle? Apparently, Prophet as well did not start any battle. Yes, there were preemptive moves by the Prophet, like, for example, going to Tabuk because he heard that they are gathering force. He didn't raid the land, he didn't take any land, he just went there uh, on the borders, stopped there, and when, of course, they they were scared and they uh, scattered, he came back. Yes, preemptive moves is allowed. Or if we know that some country or some people want to attack and we preempt and go attack and attack them, this doesn't mean just in battlefield. If they are gathering force to attack you, yes, you, are, you have the right to preempt and stop that. Otherwise, uh, the prophet did not do it. Is it, was it allowed to Prophet to do it? Now, we have one case in the Quran which shows that some Prophets, some of the Ma'asumin, took this initiation of call. And that is the story of Suleiman and Queen Sheba, isn't it? That, of course, there was no provocation from Yemen, from Queen Sheba. Only uh, Suleiman salam heard that they worshiping son, uh, worshiping uh, the son. And he sent them a letter that Allah ta'alu alayya wa atuni muslimin. Do not uh, resist uh, before me and submit to me. And uh, you know the story. However, again, that should be uh, investigated further to see why particularly Yemen, while there were many other idolaters around Suleiman, why particularly he wanted to attack Yemen. Uh, it is a probability that because Yemen had a, a sort of huge hegemony over, uh, over Jaziratul Arab and northern parts of Hejaz, it may have been a possibility that again it was a sort of preemptive action. At any case, uh, up to, if we are in this verse, and if we do not say that it's mansukh, as many, especially Sunni scholars have said that it's mansukh, if we are only, if it's only us and this verse, initiating jihad with mushrikeen is not permissible. Because he said, وَقَاتِلُوا الَّذِينَ وَقَاتِلُوا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ الَّذِينَ يُقَاتِلُونَكُمْ وَلَا تَعْتَدُوا إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُحَبُّ الْمُؤْتَدِينَ Now, when we come to the following verse then, uh, there are more, it sheds more light on what it, this means. Inshallah, we we'll leave that for next week. Thank you, Shay. Very interesting. Brothers and sisters, now we have 15 20 minutes to further discussion and clarify any points. Uh, any brothers, sisters? No, okay, then I'll start with Sheikh. Um, only a couple of, uh, uh, talking about uh, transgressing in the Holy War. A um, couple of days ago, I heard in Urdu Majalis that one of the battle, I think it was he mentioned, if I'm not forgetting, um, Battle of Khaybar, when the enemies were defeated and uh, one of the high profile enemy was killed by Imam Ali. He went 
and decapitated his head and went towards the Prophet to show him that at that time Jafar Tayyar was retiring from uh, after a long time from Yemen. Now, is that possible? From Abyssinia. From Abyssinia. Is that possible, Imam Ali, to decapitate? A dead person. Well, they had to decapitate. Is it? <laughs> <laughs> if they did not decapitate, uh, in many battles, of course, it was to somehow terrify the enemy, to deter them from uh, making uh, uh, more assault. However, this was only when they had these uh, hand-to-hand -hand battles, single battle combat, so to speak. They fought. Uh, individually against each other, when, of course, the war uh, was uh, uh, between armies and there were many casualties or, or many, uh, many dead. After that, it was not permissible to, to chop the heads. It was only on that occasion that to show to the enemy that this man is killed, uh, this what had happened. However, again, we have to see, we have to investigate whether these are true stories or not. Because to my mind, it is still uh, unacceptable. Anyway, you have know. you ever been to war? <laughs> no, I haven't been to war. <laughs> for, for, for an Imam Ali or some of his caliber to look like that, to sort of uh, treat somebody a dead you person like here that. Here it <laughs> said one of the cases of Etada is Mutla. And Mutla is one instance of Mutla is to decapitate. Decapitate is Mutla. It's not permissible. Okay? However, if there is. Uh, a reason for it, like when in single battle they had to, uh, to, to chop the head to show to the enemy that the man is killed. And this happened when the great, uh, the great warriors were killed. And it would have been like a defeat for, for them. It would have made a justification for it. Okay, thanks. So let's move forward. Any brothers, sisters? Yeah. Sheikh. Alaykum, Sheikh. Um, so I know this, uh, you are trying not to get into the quagmire, because reading the four verses together, um, it might be that at the time of the Umayyads, they actually use these verses to very good effect mm -hmm. against anybody who had an uprising. And of course, we all know about the biggest uprising there. So it's, I'm, I'm actually fearful of going down this path to start this discussion just now. Um, no, the following verses, uh, let us discuss them next week. Of course, yes, yes, of course. Because uh, actually the following verses explain this more clearly. Much clearly, yeah. yes. So I'm trying to see whether there's a link between 188 and 189. Because we said do not uh, eat up each other's property by false means. And then we said about the authorities might help you do that. You yes, see? that's it. That's and a then, connection. and then you go into okay. So we can, uh, you know, say the new moon is not that important to this discussion, but it goes on to say it is not righteousness that you come to your houses from their back. It is important. The new moon as well is important in this discussion because, uh, especially when it says because months of Hajj were months of uh, no war, no fighting. Okay, and uh, therefore. Uh, actually, one of the exodus here, Fakhruddin Razi, mentions uh, that the best explanation for this, uh, uh, why Hajj is mentioned here, is by Qaffal shashi a fourth century exodus, who says that because Allah has prohibited war in those months, and the Kuffar used to somehow sometimes postpone this horma to other months to continue fighting in these months. This was nasi, innama nasi'u ziyadatun fel kufr. It is in, increase in kufr. So yes, in that sense, it is related to the following verses. Yeah, maybe it's because of the noise, yeah, that's it, yeah. So I can't see the connection between the Hajj. That's fine, it stands as an edict in its own about the fighting. But they go into the doors from the back. I'm not sure if the reason you mentioned was the only one. 
Is there any other reason mentioned for, uh, for this uh, particular verse about entering the houses from the front? Is it possible that there's another explanation? No one has mentioned any other explanation, but always there are possibility of other explanations. But no exegetes have mentioned any other explanation. Okay. Thank you Thank so much. You. Thank, Thank you. Any sisters? Sisters? Riaz? Riaz, can you pass the mic? Thank you very much for today's lecture. I'm particularly grateful I was here today to hear the explanation of the latter part of verse 189. It's absolutely beautiful in terms of about people understanding. Only fighting those who fight you. Well, uh, about the entering from the, the, oh, the back the, door. Oh, 88, and, okay. Yeah. And it's very clear, isn't it? Yes. The authority of the Ahlul Bayt is beautifully clear. I mean, you don't even have to think too long to be able to understand that. Not that I would have done without your help, but ultimately uh, it doesn't take a huge scholarly activity to actually understand what Absolutely. it is, especially in the context and, yes. you know, and, then, and the following hadith which happened and, and everyone accepts it. So it's a recurring question, Sheikh, and there might not be an answer, but given this very clear explanation, given the fact that it's so clear, it's like the sun shining on you, why don't people accept this? Why don't? Why are there people who are? Why is everybody in the world not a follower of, of the Amir? I can't understand it. I mean, there are people who we meet regularly on occasions, and we've had people come here, and they talk about the love for the Ahlul Bayt. They talk about, you know, the Quran in the Ahlul Bayt. They talk about Hadith Thaqalain. They talk about everything from their sources. Mm. Why is there a barrier? Well, this is why Fatima peace be her was so outraged and amazed, isn't it? That why are you doing these things, having heard all these narrations from the Prophet, everything in the Quran, why are you doing this? So, what can we say? <laughs> There's many sisters. No, a brother, yeah, can you pass the mic? Sorry, my apologies. Yeah, so based on verse 190, how, how would you go about spreading Islam? So I want to invite the people of China to Islam. I contact the king. He says, take a hike. Um, what would you do? Is that transgression? You mean you go and fight the people of China? Well, we're not allowed to transgress in war. They haven't attacked us, but I want to spread Islam into a new into a new land. Well, some of the exes here have mentioned that the only way to spread Islam is to somehow spread the word, not by fighting. And even the conquests, you know, the conquests were not very instrumental in conversion. Conversion was a, something happened later due to people's willingness. I mean, for example, we had the conquest of Spain by Omevitz. Did it help at all to convert people to Islam? It didn't. And as soon as they found power, they actually obliterated all traces of Islam from their culture, isn't it? In Persia, people were willing to do it. They were tired of, uh, of their, their kings and others. And the rate of conversion after conquest was so huge. I mentioned this before. Uh, the second caliph issued, issued a, an, an edict to his commanders in Persia that do not accept conversion because we cannot deal with it here in terms of our bookkeeping. Because when they convert, they come from paying jizya to paying zakat and that made lots of bookkeeping change and all these things. So this is a document that Omar wrote to his commander, do not accept conversion and we do not want any more conversion in Persia, regard them as just Ahlul Jizya and Ahlul Kitab. So you see, the conquest itself is not very helpful. And imagine if now, for example, we find power and we go and fight people of China to force them to Islam. If they are not willing, if they do not accept the beauty of Islam, would they convert? No, they only fight us and we would only kill each other. So it may not be the best way to convert people. Take any sisters? Sisters, any brothers? 
So does it mean that, Sheikh, that uh, it may not be wrong to say that the Islam was spread by this sword? Was it? I don't think it, is spread, it was spread by sword at all. No? I mean, there were lots of conquests, but conversions were not because of those conquests. For several reasons. First of all, those countries uh, who were actually uh, conquered, they were not mushrikun, they were mostly Ahlul Kitab. They could have kept their faith. But they like to convert to Islam. And like Persia, I mean, the, the, the majority of the scholars in fiqh, in hadith, in Quran, these uh, reciters, this Al Quran or Sabah, four of them are Persians, you see. They came by all their heart into Islam. I don't think conquests were very instrumental. And we have certain cases like Indonesia in which there was no war at all, and they all converted because of businessmen uh, going there and spreading Islam. Uh, initially, like, I mean, there was a conquest to capture land, so in a way, indirectly trying to spread Islam, wasn't it? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Sisters? No? Brother Riaz? Yeah. From the <coughs> conquests with weapons, Let's switch to something that happened from love, from what I hear from the pulpit, that Iran or parts of it were converted to Shia because of love, because there were happened to be the ruler at that time <coughs> was inclined towards the faith of uh, saying that you cannot, um, you cannot remarry the same uh, woman. I think if I remember hearing it a few years ago, it's about the king who uh, who was given a solution into so his the marriage? The Mongols problems. actually converting to Shia, not Persians. This was a, that was the Mongol king, who sought solution from Allama Heli about remarrying his wife, who he had uh, divorced three times in one majlis. That's the one. Yes, so yes that please. was Mongols, and it was Mongol king actually. Uh, that's a different story. But Persia in Persia. <laughs> I've actually heard that parts of Iran were were converted because of this, and of course the I mean, Middle East, right? So, <clears throat> so he's saying that parts of Iran were were converted. Like. So I'm just comparing that people spread Islam by the sword, and here Islam was sword by was spread by love, if you know what I mean. So obviously we all know the spreading of Islam is got to be through character. You have to exemplify your character. You have to spread yourself. Show your character amongst the people about integrity, honesty, and caring for your community. And obviously, that's where the Salam Center comes in as well. Yeah. Thank you. Inshallah, when, uh, yeah, thank you for uh, publicizing Salam Center. But uh, next week, uh, when we discuss the whole verses together, and when we see the view of Allah, Taba, Taba, it becomes more clear what these verses mean, Inshallah. Thank you, any sisters? Assalamu alaikum wa Do you not believe that um, this verse actually uh, can be reinterpreted in the 21st century? I mean, this this is the thing about, you know, I'm really thinking about uh, how we actually comprehend the Quran in the 21st century. And there are, you know, various verses that, of course, only it was applicable at that particular time, because that was the norm, that was the way to to spread Islam. Is you know, it's through battles. This is the culture. This is the, this was the philosophy of what people actually understood. Was you know the the battles at that time. And if we were to live at that particular time, then battles would be the norm. You know, this is the way that we actually uh, perhaps uh, um, engage uh, in 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 spreading Islam or in, in du'a. But in, in the 21st century, we can perhaps take this particular verse and apply it to what is the, the philosophy of spreading knowledge? What is the philosophy of, or the methodology of, of comprehending these particular things? And I, and I find that and, and, you know, we can interpret this as, as you know, perhaps the social media of, of our life. You know, rather than the, using the sword you know, wala uh, you know the 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 uh, using social media, but with caution. 
you know, la ta'tadu on social media as well. You know, the issue of, of trying to, of course, have the best of akhlaq, the best of uh, ethics, while we do da'wah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and of course through lectures and all the means that are acceptable in the 21st century to do da'wah. And I think that, for me, it's it's important we, we touch on, uh, because, of course, these verses can be, uh, you know, misinterpreted. People can, uh, of course, can say, you know, at this particular time, this is what, of course, Daesh and others have taken on board. And what I think what we have to do is, I'd, I'd love to hear your view on this, is is uh, apply this particular verse, but with the methodology and the philosophy used in, 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 in our time now. Well, very interesting thing you mentioned, and that is when we take this battle to media, we should uh, bear in mind la ta'tadu do not transgress. And not transgressing here means, of course, do not lie, do not exaggerate, do not uh, try to accuse wrongly your your opponents. It's, I think this, this is very clear. And also it comes in other verses, like, for example, الأحسن means there should be no lies, no accusations, not seeking to... Uh, uh, through batil means to prove a haq, a cause. These are all true. However, even if we take these verses literally, even today it does not allow us to fight unless we are attacked. And today, if you are attacked, of course we have to fight, isn't it? And uh, especially, for example, the, the following verse which says, أَخْرَجُوهُمْ مِنْ حَيْثُ أَخْرَجُكُمْ they, they drove you out of your lands, so go and take it back. So this is, uh, uh, in a sense, something that universally is acceptable by all uh, moral values, that if people are attacked, they have the right to defend themselves. If people are driven out of their homes, they have the right to go and fight for it. So I think they are still applicable. But yes, today we have a new battle on another ground, and that is on media and uh, in, um, uh, in a sort of uh, philosophical arguments and such things. And that Adam al of course, applies there very nicely, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Any sisters? Any brothers? Last one? No? Thank you, Sheikh Muhammad Wa'al Muhammad Salwad. We continue next week, inshallah.